going on right now. Doctors are protesting, are striking. Um, and, you know, I think nurses have had their fair share of strikes, and sometimes it's for wages, sometimes just too much work. But one area which is most relevant, I suppose, for this generation, which is very unique, which has never been the case before, is the area of mental health. And I suppose for a lot of people, it's an area that they don't really understand, you know, and it's difficult to get to the bottom of. And the government, you know, is, is trying to do the best that they can. Um, yeah, but it's one that I personally don't really understand. You know, I've kind of encountered a little bit and, and us being friends, you know, being with you through your journey. And so, you know, I thought it'd be good to start off with, uh, yeah, just a little glimpse into, yeah, what the experience is like, you know, and, and it's not just a statistic on a paper, um, but it's something that's quite prevalent, the term mental health. Um, um, yes, many people have heard of the phrase psychotic episode, but not many people know what that entails. or And some would have personal experience of what it means, of course. I had a psychotic episode mm. at 19 years old. I had never done drugs. I never done alcohol. I was never sexually abused in any way. Never. Never. Never drugs. Never drugs. Never smoked. Never alcohol. Never, never weed. Smoked. No. Not even. All through high school. All through high school. Yep. Okay. That's what makes it a unique statistic. Yes, quite a unique statistic, mm. quite a thing that that uh, is hard to grapple for yeah. a lot of people. And so I, I, in spite of that clean slate, yeah, I did experience a psychotic episode at 19 years old and. As part of that episode, I yes, as part of that episode, I uh, wasn't eating properly. Mm. I had extended periods where I wasn't sleeping properly. I had uh, elevated um, emotions, mm. and um, it was it was painful to sleep. Mm. On the one hand, you're not getting that sleep, so you you feel tired and you want to, but on the other hand, there's just this pain associated with it. Mm. Your body is refusing to shut down mm. and get into that state of rest. And so I experienced this and for an extended period too. Of not sleeping. Extended period, not, yep. Not eating properly. Not eating properly. I yeah. lost a lot of weight. I do remember actually. Yeah. You were looking like me for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What did your parents think during that time? They didn't understand what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people didn't understand what was happening with me. I didn't even understand yeah. what was happening with me. So yeah. I don't. Yeah. I can't blame anyone for not understanding. Yeah. Um I didn't either. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was quite an unusual thing. And um of course uh I had barricaded the home at one point and was sort of in my little hermit shell and and there inside the home and the uh my parents, my sister, my and my mom left the home and shortly afterwards the cops came and did a good job of telling me to come in with them and they uh, assist me and mm. eventually I was put in a mental yeah. place. Because so. I, I recall, you know, the whole episode of barricading. Do you remember emptying the tracts onto the carport floor? Yes. And the books? So I, what I, were you... I threw my computer out. Yes, you did. I was going to mention the computer as yeah. well. But what were you thinking when the cops came? Um, I wasn't too concerned. Hmm. I wasn't too concerned. Um, they did a good job of not um, making it a a tussle. Yeah, they were just very calm and you know, assisting me in a very calm manner. Mm. Yeah, I think what how I felt really was um, when I was in the mental health place. Yeah. Know? So so yeah. up to this point, you just kind of went along with it. You were fine. You just went along from the. Yes. Cop station, answered the questions they asked you, went to the mental health ward. Because then I wasn't allowed in there. Your parents weren't allowed. So, so then what was the experience then? Yes. Well, <laughs> I felt isolated. Yeah. And I felt like the whole world was caving in on me. Mm. And understandably, if you really think about it, because my my, my mind's gone, my eating's gone, mm -hmm. my sleep's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so you did... And you, your thought process is, is hindered. And so I just felt like the whole world had collapsed basically. Mm. 
and now I really felt it because I was in a psych ward. Mm -hmm. And you're isolated. And you're isolated and you're you're restricted on where you can go. Mm. You're obviously restricted to that location. And so it's just like, what happened? And surrounded by strangers who are acting... Yes, they... Of course, the people in your head, your issues as well. Yeah. You know? So I, that it was a frightening experience. I yeah. felt, uh, yeah, like like no one could understand me. Yeah. I couldn't understand myself. Mm -hmm. Many of the doctors didn't understand what was happening. And and many of my, my parents were new to the mm. whole idea of mental health as well, coming from that older generation. Mm. And so, yeah, I had emotions and feelings and a whole experience that I was going through that I wasn't able to express or mm. articulate. So I remember one time I was talking in cryptic, very cryptically, yeah. you know, <laughs> to you, and you're like, what? <laughs> you know? I do remember. Yeah, trying to say things, you know, and get and express myself, but in yeah. a very broken, cryptic manner. Yeah. I, re I did want to talk to people. I did want to be around my friends, but yeah. I choose not to harbor any hatred to yeah. anyone in yeah. that situation. They didn't understand what was happening. They were trying to figure out what was happening themselves, mm. the doctors, you know. Mm. Um, I don't. I choose not to harbor any hatred to anyone that going through that experience. Yeah, yeah. because you know it's an interesting thing that you know within my personal journey, you know, once upon a time I kn I knew about people, you know, but you know in the last say ten years, I know multiple people personally within my own circle you know, maybe eight or nine that have been through similar experiences, you know, which to me, it's like, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the uh, Stats New Zealand, but if I do a survey within my own circle, it's like, wow, I, I personally know nine people. It must be on the increase, you know, these kind of things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a stat that um, someone was sharing, which was to do with depression, that like 50% over 50% of young New Zealanders will experience mental illness before they reach 18. Mm -hmm. That's like, what? I didn't even know about uh, mental illness uh, a lot about it. I mean, maybe we just weren't educated about it, but it was not like a common thing growing up, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know how many, I suppose, people you've come across. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, what your perception of the situation is. Yes, there are people in my family who have also had mental illness after, slightly before for some of them, like my sister, and then after me, like my my dad, you know. Yeah. So, um, what, what did your sister experience? Yes, she, she had bulimia. So she was um, okay. uh, not eating properly and, yeah. and all the things associated with, with that. that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it is on the rise. Mm. It needs to be accounted for in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, yeah. Because yeah. how long has it been, I suppose, since that initial uh, experience? So 19, now, now I'm 25. So, so six se years. Seven. Seven. Seven years. Yeah. Seven years of uh, that whole experience. And uh, I'm on medication mm. still. And... Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a long time, and I had episodes after that too. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, you know, I'm asking the patient here, mm. you know, not the doctor, but in your perception, you know, what do you think went on, or what do you think is going on? Because I I, I think for the average person, uh, they've just got no idea. Like I, I seriously had no idea what to do, um, mm -hmm. and you know, this was coming from. Uh, you know, I was a, a church man. We were working together and it was like, what do I do? Do we pray? Do we, what do we do? You know, mm. uh, do we need to go through a detox program or something, <laughs> you know, go to a camp? And, and we tried a lot of those things, you know, and, mm. and I suppose, yeah. What do you think is going on? Yeah. So one, one thing that was tried was medication when yeah. I went through the episode, you know, um, and when you're in that episode, you want relief from it. Yeah. And so you want to try the things that are offered. And mm. so I did, you know, I thought that was a good step to at least get that out of the way. Yeah. You know, uh, we're going through the possibility of how to treat this thing. First step, the easiest step is medication, you know. Mm. So 
they tried that you know and um but yeah what was going on is the question and yeah. what was what was happening it's difficult to understand it's difficult to understand yeah. i think that the mind something went wrong in the mind yeah and the mind's trying to correct itself or, or in the body the body's trying to correct itself yeah it manifests in an episode or something yeah I'm not so, an expert. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, I suppose maybe yeah. maybe from <laughs> from the ones you've interacted with, because I know, you know, you've been uh, in those circles since then. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned to me that, you know, a lot of the people that are in there are in there for other reasons, that, you know, yours is not the, the, the rule for most people, mm. that for a lot of people, the reasons that it's, a, it's a, an issue is because they had, you know, uh, a trigger through weed mm -hmm. or some sort of, stronger drugs uh mm -hmm. that you actually interacted with yes my <laughs> there was many people in there because of weed yeah many people I bro was... but it's just a plant <laughs> it's just it just grows god made green didn't he what i've seen is that people can can get psychotic like tendencies yeah. when taking it yeah and and i was in a certain ward in the in the um in that mental health journey yeah with young people because mm -hmm. I was young at the time. So I was the under so lots of young people, a lot of young people under twenties, you know? Yeah. And, and the consistent thing was weed. You know, yeah. a lot of them had taken it, yeah. had screws had come loose yeah. and they were in that situation, you know? Yeah. And so one of the things, one of the other things that the doctors tried was a blood test, which yeah. makes sense too. Nothing in the system. No drugs. Yeah. You, you know, right. um, yeah. On the subject of weed, it's an interesting thing mm -hmm. because, you know, I used to watch comedy and, and mm -hmm. you know, it was all about, because even, you know, a lot of the, the reggae music, you know, is all about, uh, I don't know if you know the song by Bob Marley, excuse me while the light must mm -hmm. live. So, you know, for us in that phase, you know, smoking weed, it was, it was like the cool thing, you know, it was mm -hmm. like what people do to liberate themselves from the rat race and, you know, break free and, and think independently. But, you know, I remember an episode that I had when I had come to New Zealand and, you know, I remember smoking spots in Dominion Road, you know, and it was really peer pressure. I gave in and I had two spots in 2.25 liter bottles and I, I had a manic psychotic episode mm. and it was from Dominion Road to Mission Bay. And it was like my thoughts were racing 100 miles an hour and I couldn't grab hold of one thought, you know. And even as I tried to look at the road, it was just like everything was just fast paced. And I was sitting at the back with a friend of mine, this girl, and I was like, are you serious? And I remember thinking I would rather be dead than to carry on living like this because, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was torment for me, you know. Um, and then the cops came at Mission Bay. I remember hiding behind her, you know, and I was just totally terrified that I, I was afraid to even have a conversation with the cops because I was in no frame of mind. Mm. And I suppose, you know, even though others handle it differently, uh, there's a vast majority of people who have those episodes and never recover. Because mm -hmm. if I had not recovered, seriously, the fact is the thoughts that were crossing my mind were not good. Mm -hmm. You know, there were very dark thoughts of how I would stop this because it was torment, mm -hmm. really excruciating torment. Yeah. Uh, but it seemed innocent. It's just weed, you oh, know. It's, please stay away from drugs, I, people. I've been in the psych ward. Yeah. I've seen the dark places that people can mm. get to. And the big factor was drugs. Totally. You know? Yeah. And there's no question about it, especially with young people, too, whose minds are naturally creative they want to figure out the world you know explore explore things mm. you know and then you go on that false synthetic um high you know yeah and you think you're discovering new things mm. and your brain is invincible yeah yeah but your brain is a is a delicate organ yeah you know and it will correct an imbalance yeah know? and that correction from that imbalance of taking the drug may mean an episode yeah you know, that it has to go through to in order to restore right conditions mm. you know and so there's many people in there who, who are because of drugs. And, and maybe just tried it once. It's like, oh, just exactly. this once. Like, <laughs> that was a one-off for me, and it was terrible. Plenty of young... I've interacted yeah. with them, yeah. yeah. As, got, as being one of the people who was part of the program yeah. to, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, you know, to... to yeah. Yeah, as part of that 
uh, wave of young people in there, you know, in the, pro- in the, in the program trying yeah. to figure out what's happening. And yeah. we did, we, we went out, we had fun times and played tennis and as part of the program and, and um, did some cooking and all the rest of those things, you know, played some games, bowling, you yeah. know. So, and, and, and in that environment, you talk to people, you're around people, you interact with people and common factor. Yeah. Drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Pause. Do you need to blow your nose? Yes. Go do that. <laughs> oh, did you pause it? What am I pausing? Ah, uh, just cut it and then we'll just stitch them together. Yeah, so so it's an interesting thing, the weed thing, because, you know, uh, was it last year when there was a referendum, whether to legalize marijuana or not? We did have that referendum, yeah. Yes, yes, you know, and as we go out and talk to people, a lot of people are totally for it, especially young people, because it just seems like a recreational drug, you know, and it's a, it's a, a marvel to me that, you know, on a government level, for the first time in history, people are thinking about profiting off something that could be, you know, uh, yeah, detrimental to society. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things that you kind of think, wow, are we going to make more tax off uh, another dangerous substance like we do off cigarettes and then tax the health system uh, more because of the consequences of that? It, it seems to be a little bit of a conundrum, actually. Yeah, and I think people must realize that your sanity is precious. Mm. You know? A lot of people have the weed experience so that they can have an experience that's not part of the normal mm-hmm. baseline reality, you yeah. know? and they crave that experience. But they should, you should. I my salutation to them is your reality is more pre- is very precious. You know, it's a fine line that your that your brain has to go through. You know, mm. to, in order to keep sane. And when you when you do lose your faculties, like I did, and you're no longer eating, sleeping, thinking coherently, and you feel like the world's collapsed because your world has collapsed, mm-hmm. really. Once you bounce back from that, you realize, wow, the things I take for granted, <laughs> you know? The, the, this mundane reality that I that you can take for granted. It's very precious. Very precious. Mm. You know? And it's very delicate, too. Your brain is a very delicate, you yeah. know, a very delicate organ, you know? Yeah. And and the things it has to do in order to perceive what you're perceiving that everyone can understand, and, you know, in, in that mm. reality, you know, and to touch the switch, you know, now and to change it, even for a moment, yeah. it's like, be very careful when you, yeah. if you're going to choose to do that. And my recommendation is don't do that. You yeah. Know? When you go through the mental health crisis, you then realize that. Thank you, Lord, for the, <laughs> the, the reality that you've made, mm. uh, the, the normalcy again. You mm. know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, um, I, I'm no psychologist. I'm no doctor, you know, but, you know, I've been around not that long, but, but long enough to notice a significant change with the whole mental health stats, you know. So the whole depression and anxiety is, to- is totally a, a new phenomenon for this generation. It's like a common thing, you know. Uh, and I kind of wonder, you know, because obviously it's difficult to get answers for every situation like yours is a little bit of a, mm. a a puzzling one because you know no drugs none of that yeah. but i wonder if you know when we look at what's changed in the last 20 years in society that would make these things mm. the way they are i mean have you ever considered the reality that uh maybe uh th- s- screen time has mm. something to do with mental health because you know i've read articles by doctors you know i've read books written some of them in the 1800s one in particular called uh ministry of healing i think and they talk about the correlation between uh media and people's mental well-being mm-hmm. you know i don't know if you've i mean i've thought about this myself and i think that a lot of the things that we are exposed to on media the frightening things mm. it's a whole different level of frightening yeah you know then i mean say a while ago you're out in the jungle and a lion comes to you, you yes know? that would cause you some distress right yeah and you would be cautious afterwards as you go out but mm. now it's like we, we tap into that high that we want from that experience and artificially give it to ourselves in the comfort of our home constantly you know getting scared getting frightened mm-hmm. watching things that can be grotesque you know things like texas chainsaw massacre uh-huh. you know? even the saw you saw you know <laughs> jaws yeah yeah so those things 
if we were to see them in reality, would make us traumatic. They know? would be a traumatic experience. It would be a traumatic. Absolutely. It would be a traumatic experience. Yeah. And so to artificially induce that now and then mm. expect that it doesn't. I mean, the reason why we want films to be more realistic is so that we can really feel what's happening, mm -hmm. and our body does respond to mm. what's on screen as if it's real. Mm. You know, you're crying, you're getting afraid, yes, you're screaming, and you, it's like you forget that this is just an act. Yes, yes, and 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 that's what people aim for mm. is to forget that it's an act. They want mm -hmm. it to be so real <laughs> that. That they're totally in, deceived and they, they really be, in there. are responding to you're it. talking to the character like, no, no, how yeah. could you? <laughs> they really get invested in it, you know? Yeah. And so, especially like a, a young person now, you yeah. know, exposed to that sort of thing. Or to children. Children exposed to that thing or yeah. to be consistently exposed to it, you know? Yeah. We may feel okay afterwards when start things going, but those are deep-seated mm. emotions, you know, that can crop up. Mm. You know, many people were scared to go to the beaches after Jaws. Yes. Now, now it's an important point Anxiety you bring up. Occurred. My wife is one of those people. Mm -hmm. And many people are scared of the duck after they watch a horror movie. You know, and we watch heaps of them. Chucky and all these ghost <laughs> movies of haunted houses. And it, it, it's imprinted in your brain as, as an experience you've had. Not just a movie you watch, but an experience you had. Because you feel stuff. I remember going with a group of boys to watch snakes on a plane and we were in the movie house and there's a scene where the snake jumps at the screen and this whole crowd of boys are like, ah! <laughs> and yeah. you think, come on fellas, come on, toughen up. Yeah. But your brain is thinking this is really happening. Mm -hmm. And and what do you do with all that expended adrenaline? You're just mm. sitting there. Like if it's out in the jungle, it's like you're ready to fight now. Yes, I'm fight or flight. I'm out of here. <laughs> you're all run, you know, mm. and you have that energy now from that, from that, from what that danger yeah and you're ready to take action either one way or the other but yeah here you're stationary yeah and just absorbing it in that dose i mm. I, I can't I, surely there's an Im impact. there is an impact in totally the, you know, it, yeah you know have you seen people do this when when it's a scary mm -hmm. scene or when we were young and there was a sex scene or a kissing mm -hmm. scene the automatic response was this yeah you know or you're kind of like <laughs> oh is it finished yet is it finished yet yeah and that is a an instinctual response because your brain doesn't want to be exposed to that. And, you know, mm. I think of my daughter, my youngest daughter. She's seven now. But since she was very young, we would watch what we thought were good Christian content. But it was, you know, stories of people being persecuted or, you know, people being um, tortured or chased, chased after. But, you know, they were heroic stories. But actually, the experience was scary. And she would always close her ears. Or she would like, please, can we change it? And we would all, the, the whole family is like, oh, come on, it's just a movie. But for her, it's not. Mm. For her, it's really happening. And, you know, we would kind of talk it off. And yet her, her instincts are saying, don't watch this, you know. And so I'm thinking that's the response with sex. We used to close our eyes. That's the response with violence, you know. And, yeah, what's the long-term effect of your brain being constantly exposed to that, yes. you know. Not only your brain, but your body too. Your body, mm. because you're you're feeling these things too. Yeah. And uh, what is the long term effect? You know, and that the the avenue of that median for doing those things has increased. You know, over mm -hmm. time now it's very accessible. Mm. So you have a multiplicity of people being accessible to it at very young ages too. That's right. You know, and so is there an effect? You know, would people have anxieties? You it's know? true. And and like sometimes um. I know some people, they smell something in the kitchen and it takes them back to... Totally. You know, Nan and Nan's cooking yeah, or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So yeah. your mind can do that. Just the experience and the sights that you see can be so ingrained in you that it comes out at a time when you're... Somewhere else. Somewhere yeah. else, you know. Yeah. And, and that happens with songs even. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, The definitely. song takes me way back, people say, you know. Yeah, and yeah. to those feelings too, yeah. you know, and yeah, that nostalgia, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a, something that should be looked into it should you know? be because you know the thing about media is it's it's totally a bombardment of the brain of the senses it's not of your feet of your legs so people aren't struggling with any other part except mental health and that's precisely where you're being bombarded by the media and so i'm thinking you know from a young age for for countries other countries and i think i heard france you know was putting restrictions on children under three but nowadays it's not a shock to see a one-year-old two-year-old just on the phone watching or for hours on end mm. 
So for them to put restrictions, it's like, okay, there must be a noticeable scientific effect of media on the brain. Yes. Clearly. <laughs> I remember when I was really young, uh, I was exposed to um, this movie called uh, Final Destination. I watched it, like little bits of it. With I, some I've friends, watched it too. With some friends, you know. And some of the scenes in there, it's like, you don't know where the danger is going to come from. You think it's going to come from a certain place and then it comes from a different place. And so there's this heightened anxiety <laughs> that they that, that's induced. You know, it's like you, you hear a pin drop, you know, and you think, is that where it's going to come from, the danger? Or you hear a, a machine in the background, is that where it's going to come from? You know, and you get that anxiety. Mm-hmm. I tell you, even after even after the, <laughs> the thing, you know, all the boys that were there in this home when we were watching that, we don't want to touch the electric wires in yeah. the back, you know? Well, what about if you're driving on the motor and there's a truck with logs in front oh. of you and you're like, change lanes? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know? It's like, nah, yeah. I don't want to go there, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I think to myself, you know, that I think this is an the elephant in the room, uh, the reality of media, because my son said to me, he rung me last night, and he's at Nana's house and he's like, Dad, I want to come home. And I said, son, just stay home because my wife wanted to have some quiet time. So anyway, he's, he's trying to negotiate and he says, you know, Dad, I watched a movie I shouldn't have watched with my sister. And ever since then, I've been having nightmares when I'm there. And so obviously, you know, I had to think, oh, you know, he, he's being honest that he's being tormented by nightmares from a movie he watched, which he shouldn't have and he knows he shouldn't have. So much so that he feels afraid to sleep at Nana's house from Mm. now on, you know? Um, So there's no question that there is an effect. That even though the movie's gone, he knows he's safe. Mm. It's imprinted in his mind something that makes him feel afraid even though there's no danger, which is what anxiety is. That's exactly what it is. It's exactly like no what one's is. hurting you. You're fine. Yet you're at this. You're you're in the state as if there are dangers. Absolutely, you know? like you're about to die. Yeah, yeah. totally. And some people will heavy breathing and just. I've seen that myself. Totally, totally. You know, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. this is a deep point, you know, because we were having this discussion even about PTSD. You know, that soldiers go to war, and they witness it doesn't even have to be something they did Mm. it could be something they saw and it's so traumatic that they come back and they have post-traumatic stress disorder and it's a real thing they're experiencing of what they witnessed so then is there a connection between soldiers seeing it in real life and children and and just ordinary humans witnessing it on the screen Mm. You know, because it's something you're watching. You're seeing violence perpetrated, people's limbs being chopped mm. off, heads being chopped off, and it gets more and more gruesome as mm. time goes on. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's <laughs> like you say. It is the elephant in the room. Mm. It is the thing that I mean. Horror movies are a billion dollar industry. You know. It is. And it's movies in general. Yeah, yeah. Movies in general. You yeah. know, it's something that it's it is the in- entertainment medium. You know. Mm. And uh, even countries, as you've said, have put restrictions on uh, certain media screen times, you know, mm. especially for younger people, you know, mm. and who knows what kind of imprinting you're, you're putting in your body, yeah. especially, you know, when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a deep subject, you know. Mm. Um, so, so I wanted to shift to another uh, element because I think this one here is food for thought when it comes to anxiety, you know, when it comes to a lot of the other uh, unexplainable Um, manic things that the brain experiences, you know, because even the drugs, and one interesting thing about drugs is, you know, when you're on, uh, say, people do mushrooms, they do ecstasy, they do, people are hallucinating. So then the same kind of trauma the brain can be exposed to because you're seeing things that are not really there. And so that trauma, I think, is what actually breaks you, Mm. you know. It's like a post-traumatic stress disorder because that's what the drug does to you. Mm. Um. But I wanted to 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 talk about depression, mm. um, because you know, I think that that one is also quite a big one. And uh, you know, this uh, John Kerwin comes out on the TV talking about his experience with depression. But but this one is is often less obvious. You know, it's difficult to discern. You can tell someone with a manic episode, but you can't tell often who has depression. And I think this one is the most prevalent globally. Um. You know, I don't have a, a, a specific statistic um, about depression. But, you know, when you think about 
it being in the category of mental uh, health, uh, what are your thoughts on depression and what the causes of this one could be? Mm, mm. I think for me, when I think of depression, it's it's one of those things like you carry your brain wherever you go. Mm. And so, and you filter the world through that brain, you know. Mm. Sometimes the the recommendations for depression have been to, for example, uh, expose yourself to nature, you know, mm-hmm. the beautiful things of nature. Stuck you know? inside too much. Yeah, yeah. You carry this with you when you go outside, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, everything is filtered through that. Mm. And even when you're exposed to the blessings of nature, it still doesn't take away. For some people, you can still be depressed still be in depressed nature in that environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What the, the aim of that aim of that exercise is to is for you to respond to it. Yeah, you know, but in a positive way. You know, mm. oh hey, look at the flowers and stuff, and hey, well, life isn't that bad. You know, but that's meaning. Yeah, that's meaning that you're attaching to nature. It's not just the tree made you. Yeah, it's, trees don't heal depression. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the meaning that's attached to it. Oh, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. The world isn't such a bad place. That's all meaning, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, there's there are some the sun's out, you know. I feel mm. grateful. Even art, it's like it's not going to. Yeah, the heal art it. itself doesn't, but it's the, what, what's attached to it, you yeah. know, which comes from here, you know. Yeah, and that's that, a good point. And that's why I, you know, things like gratitude and believing in God and having that connection with God and yeah. appreciating nature and man's yes. image, all of that stuff has to do with meaning, and it yes. and it make it makes the the going outside in nature more impactful that's a deep point yeah so so i was thinking you know depression to me kind of sounds like a deep recession oh true so your deficit you know you're empty and i think emptiness maybe lies at the core of it you know because Mm. often you you're feeling worthless my life is not worth living and it often leads to suicide very often people that commit suicide have been depressed in some way you know and I'm thinking, you know, with the point you're making about meaning, you know, at this stage in history, a lot of people are empty. You know, we were just watching before, you know, uh, a guy talking about Katy Perry and she was crying, just saying how empty she was, even though she's got everything you could desire. Mm. You think of all the celebrities like uh, uh, what's Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, uh, Robin Williams. You think of Heath Ledger, Amy Winehouse, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. Like the list is endless Mm. of people who have all that heart could wish but are empty. Mm. And so they take their own lives or or they die in just a miserable situation, even though they have everything that supposedly makes Mm. life happy. And I think that that root of emptiness, when you say meaning, for me, is connected to to God. Mm. Um. Yeah, no, it, emptiness. And it's not like, I, you know, I ate some food and now the emptiness is gone. My stomach's full now. It's, uh, it's an emotional emptiness. It may even be deep. It's like a meaning emptiness, yeah. you know, like a purposeless mm-hmm. life, you know. I've had um, my phases of that, Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, back a, in the day. Yes, it's like, you know, those things. Mm. Uh, and, you know, money or wealth or anything, it doesn't it doesn't suffice. You know, you it can doesn't. get sick of it too. You know? Totally. Yeah, because because it's here. You've got this with you. Mm. And those are all externals as well, with your own meaning attached to it. That's right. And those, you know, the wealth and pleasure doesn't suffice as a mm. as a way to make one happy and live one's life. You know, it's just like these things pass as well, and eventually the high that you get from stardom fades is a corresponding away. low. Yeah. And very away. superficial. Very super, and then you yeah. feel like oh, everyone's just you know, I just I just feel yeah. like my life is you know meaningless, meaningless and yeah. empty. You know. Yeah. That's what that's what many celebrities have felt. You know, that's right. To go into that zenith and then. That's right. Yeah. So so you know I'm thinking the Bible says that the greatest needs of humanity are connected to the greatest commandments of God, which are love God, love your neighbor. So the greatest needs of humanity are met by the greatest commandments, which means we need love from God, and we need love from man. Those are mm. the two greatest human needs. And whether you're a celebrity, a president, a poor person. If you have no love coming into your life and, you know, the God love part gives you purpose in Mm. life, you know, why am I here? You know, then you're going to be empty, you know, you're going to be empty. And the result then is that because even as a Christian, you know, I I think to myself, I'm a Christian. I've had seasons in my life where I feel like a Mm. purposeless Christian Mm. and that can give me feelings of depression Mm. because I feel like, 
you know, yes, I have this great truth that I found. I've got this great savior, but what am I doing with it? You know, I'm just not doing any, anything with it. And it can bring me down, you know, or even if I feel socially isolated or lonely, like I can't connect, I do can, I can have feelings of depression mm. sometimes. And often, you know, in those seasons, um, there are remedies, you know, mm. like text a friend and connect with him, but also mm. I, the, the superficial prayer, which you can sometimes have doesn't work. You really need deep mm. seasons of deep prayer and you actually, mm -hmm. uh, fix the problem yeah. i think the a, a personal god yeah is is the thing you know it's mm. not like a theory of god but the personhood of god that you can turn to that you can turn to mm. and and even the personhood of someone of, you know it's not just i like someone and they, i hear all these nice things about them but you know you being in association with them and having a personal encounter with someone mm. so you say before love god and love man yeah love is that personal aspect totally you know? it's not just the theory of god mm. or the theory of man it's like here's the here's the the person in front of you you know that that you can connect with heart to heart you know mm. so it's really important you know and and that's why god is a personal being you know and we are a people who desire personal lateral relationships you know yeah it's that person connection that's really important that's right. even if you're sad it's always better when someone else is sad with you absolutely you, you know? <laughs> it's like yeah we're not alone i'm not alone that's right you know that's a very good point yeah. you know you, you know <laughs> to to connect this back to the the media thing you know nowadays there's so much i've got an article here and it's it's worth reading uh it says Health professionals warn the constant threat of illness, social isolation, economic worries, grief from family separation, and other pressures uh, imposed by COVID have both compounded the distress of those who are already vulnerable to mental health problems and caused people to experience symptoms of conditions such as anxiety and depression for the first time. It goes on and it's like prominent health figures, including the leaders of Mental Health Foundation, etc., said that, you know, warned that New Zealand was already struggling to cope with the provision of mental health challenges before COVID. A wave of new problems is overwhelming public mental health services. But, you know, it, it says there's social isolation and then, you know, grief from family separation, like, like these uh, situations within life. And I think to myself, you know, how many uh, deep, meaningful relationships do people have these days? Because you might have a thousand followers on Facebook but no friends. Yeah. You might be a social influencer, but actually no friends, which I think is often the predicament of celebrities that you could be high up the top, but actually very lonely because mm. everyone, when they meet you, just want to, you to sign their autograph and then off they go. They, they don't really care about you. They want to see the persona of you. Yes. They don't want you. the real you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a sad reality. It's a sad reality, yeah. you know, and, and just, you know, it's not uncommon for people to be in a room disconnected but together mm. and so that lack of connection that lack of love because if you're channeling your attention to the phone even if you're in the presence of someone mm -hmm. the love that they need that need is not met mm -hmm. i mean how much of the world is a lie when we think about it you know you're much on your phone superficial superficial you know mm. there's actors there's the persona that people put on even mm. when they're around people yeah you know? and i think some people just think oh it's all yeah. just a lie and yeah you know? and so that personal connection element, element you know is so so important you know? yeah yeah so yeah because there is that media cultural persona that many people show you know mm -hmm. trying to get that approval it's like some people say you know oh you do you know if, do you know what obama did and stuff and people act like they know obama you know do you know obama i don't know obama <laughs> i don't you know, know him you've heard of him i don't know a politician the politicians campaign you just see yeah. their perso public persona but you yeah, don't know them that's right you know mm. and so there's that personality crisis you know what mm. am i what are others crisis. identity crisis mm. yeah identity crisis that people have yeah you know yeah, this and is, I, I sympathize with that. I do too. Strongly, mm. you know, I've had my moments like that too. Yeah. I sympathize with that. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is one element that I think the, the gospel uh, mm. and the story of Jesus really answers the identity crisis that people are going through, the disconnection. Because, you know, you're not going to get wholesome uh, counsel out there that's not telling you, 
just to focus on yourself or whatever. Here you have first, because you need love poured into you first. You know, you can't just feed yourself love. Mm. And you know, to recognize that actually uh, God recognized our trouble. You know, He knows it and He walked in our shoes and He wanted to redeem us so much, loved us so much that He was willing to die for us, you know. Because one element of depression I think that most people never get to deal with is guilt. Mm, oh, guilt true, of bad things true, we've true, done, true. guilt of things we regret. True. People don't know how to deal with that because, mm. you know, if the person doesn't want to forgive you, say you were best friends or girlfriend and you cheat on her, mm. like you feel guilty. Yeah. But how do you deal with that guilt if the person doesn't forgive you? Well, the gospel says, you know, God is there to forgive, you know, mm. even when man, you, you do your best with man, but God is the ultimate forgiver. And if God forgives you, mm. you are forgiven yes. and you're free. That personal touch of God was so important that God became a man. He became a man. To associate with us, mm. you know, and to, I mean, you have that account where, where it's like your sins are forgiven. He says yeah. to, the, to the paralytic, you know, and the woman caught in adultery. Yeah, your sins are forgiven. I mean, it, to hear that from God, you know. And then to know, because God has set an example, that He will forgive seven times. Yeah, it's not going to be brought up seven. again. Yeah, that He does forgive and that guilt is gone, you know. That's deep. So, so important. Yeah. So important, that aspect. Yeah. You know? Now, yeah. <laughs> from a political level, how do you think then, you know, this could be addressed by the government? In many ways, they cannot because this is mm. such a personal thing. Like, it's in your brain. It's a mental health issue. They mm. cannot deal with it, you know, because the causes are very personal and internal that it's it's far from the government to be able to reach that. And I think even if it's a health, uh, mental health crisis, the mental health facilities are, are powerless to really deal with it at its root, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's everyone's responsibility to connect personally with those who. Yes. You know, and to. um seek that personal thing that personal encounter you yeah know? and like it's hard to, to for a doctor to relieve guilt totally you know? they can't it's, it's a, you know they've got no power to forgive yeah yeah but we but there's that god element yeah and actually when you really obtain that guilt free you know freeness and that forgiveness you know from and and forgive others then because you know how much you've been forgiven mm. there's that joy that comes with it and liberation you feel oh, free it's a, great, <laughs> a weight off your shoulders it's the greatest liberation everyone really should have that weight totally. at some level totally and but it's not a bad thing because there is a solution yeah associated with it there is that god intervened that's right to allow for that solution and there is that joy that comes with that liberation that you're going to now spread the love to others. That's you know? right. You know, the yeah. second bit you mentioned mm. about forgiving others, that's mm. the other side of depression mm. because, you know, either your guilt is from what you've done or you carry the weight of what was done to you. Mm. And say you were abused, you were molested, you know, your parents were not good to you. And a lot of people harbor hatred towards their parents, towards their abusers, towards people who did them wrong, mm -hmm. betrayed them, their exes. You hear it coming, it leeches out of people when you go there yeah. in conversation. And all of that pulls you down and weighs you down and makes you depressed. And without what you just said, mm -hmm. that liberation from God, mm -hmm. how do you break yes. free? Forgiveness you... is the ultimate act of liberation the... <laughs> because you no longer live under the shadow yes. of the abuse uh, and the hurt. Absolutely. You know? It's like, you, yeah, you're no longer under the shadow anymore. Your life isn't dictated Incredible. by those remorses, you know. Incredible. And so forgiveness is a really important thing, a guilt-free life. You totally. Know? Um, a, a clear conscience. I mm. mean, how many people would die for that, you know? That's right. Go to sleep with a clear conscience. Incredible. You know? yeah, yeah. It's very important, mm. those things. And these are the things that religion, uh, specifically Christianity. Let's <laughs> say religion. Christianity. Yeah. So Christianity Jesus. really tackles with yes. us. Yes. In a very personal Absolutely. way, you know? And he owns that responsibility yes. that I can set you free. Yes, yes. So Christianity really is the throwing out a, a lifeboat there and people can jump on That's if they right. really you know want to if they you know all things have failed you know they haven't given christianity a try give it a try give it a try what have you yeah. got to lose you yeah. know yeah you, you know it's incredible that you have verses that talk about the renewing of the mind mm. it's like wow i've got mental health issues I need the renewing of the mind, you know, and, and that's a real promise within the Bible, you know, and, and being able to get to the root of that. Um, yep. He that's been forgiven much loves much, right? Mm -hmm. 
we all need that forgiveness. We all need that forgiveness. Yeah. And then we can start loving others. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's very important. And the gospel centers around these things. That's right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No. That, that's very good, man. That's very good. Maybe another thought to end with is the idea that, you know, sometimes you can be stuck in your own head. Mm. You know, you're just constantly thinking about yourself and your feelings and your body and, oh, everyone's against me. And, and, and your thoughts are constantly inward focused. And maybe sometimes, like you say, about being able to love when you're liberated, then you start to see the burdens of others. And that in itself offloads burdens. You know, you're not so weighed down about your problems because you find so much joy from helping others. Absolutely. It's like the parent that's, that's um, say, down one day, but they see their kids and, 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 and they see them struggling a bit and they're like, I'm going to persevere because God, of them. I'll do it for know? them. I'll do it for them. Yes. You know? That's that. That's a very good point. One aspect of that is a little bit selfish. And the other aspect is I'm now deferring that selfishness to, uh, in order to help others. Others, yeah. you know. And then so you liberate yourselves from the from your woes because you realize the responsibility that this You child, forget about yourself. Yeah, you forget about yourself to make a difference. To help someone else, you know. And so that's liberating too when, mm. you, when, when we serve others. Yeah. You know. We forget about our temporary woes or we make them become temporary in order to accommodate for the suffering of another or the responsibility to help another. That's you know? right. That's very liberating too. I know mm. some people, you know, animals too, they will, um, you know, when they're stuck in their shell and absorbed with themselves, they realize, I got the cat to feed, you know, and they hear them meow, 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 you know. It's like, okay, you know, they go to the cat, they get the food and everything, and then they look at them and they think, yeah. Pets do you know? cheer people up. They Absolutely. do cheer people up. They do. You know? Yeah, because yeah. you, you're shifting the focus away from yourself. Yeah, yeah. And acts of, acts of mm. benevolence too. Yeah. Like, you know, when you see the person on the street who's suffering, you know, and you and you decide to to cut into your savings and give them a little bit, mm. you know, and your time and give them a little bit. It's a two-way street. It is. You feel empowered as you well do. after that. You feel like, wow. It gives I you made a sense of meaning and purpose. Yes. Yes. And it's, and that comes from helping them. Yeah. You know, not them just helping you. Yeah. You know, so you you break free from this, from that that comfort to take your time and energy to help someone else, and then you get a blessing in return, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it, and it's not like they give me money in return. It's not a material mm. blessing. It's a it's a compassion. You feel the compassion. That's you right. feel the selflessness. That's right. You know, of the other. You know? Man, honestly. Service. You know, this, love God, love man. Totally. This Service. has been very insightful. And mm. I think it, if, if taken heed to, it would be a huge load off the mental health system yeah. um, because it addresses the, the root cause and, and really is a broad, uh, broad elements of people being able to, to find help yeah. that is lasting help rather than just straight away turning to a pill, even though that has its place, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So very good. Appreciate you, your time, man. It's been very good. Thanks for sharing. Thank you for being vulnerable and, and just opening up about your journey with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome.